Amen, indeed. I'm looking forward to tonight and having a whole uh, service to glorify Christ and His coming. And I hope uh, you are making plans to be here and you already made plans to be here uh, for tonight. Well, good morning and Merry Christmas. You don't know what to say back to me, do you? Good morning. Good morning. Merry Christmas. I love saying that. Uh, so um, <clears throat> if you would take your uh, Bible, I hope you have those. It, the uh, text will be on the screen, uh, but we always like uh, the hard copy edition as well. Um, or your phones, the iPads, whatever else you have there in front of you. Turn to John, uh, the Gospel of John. We're going to be in chapter 1 this morning. John is the fourth Gospel in the New Testament. So just go to Matthew, flip over a few chapters, and there you are, a few books, and there you are at John. Now, as you're doing that, um, I try to say Merry Christmas each time that, um, you know, I stand up here just because Christmas is one of my favorite times and seasons of the year. And for some of you, uh, it may not be, and that's okay, that's understandable. Uh, but for many people, Christmas is one of the most uh, exciting, hopeful, joyful times of the year. I saw this earlier this week, uh, um, a question to start us off. Uh, what has 15 actors, four settings, two writers, and one plot line? 632 Hallmark Christmas movies. <laughs> so, this past uh, uh, week I was looking at, yes, some of you, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so, I was watching uh, one of my favorite Christmas movies uh, just the other day, um, and it made me think, um, and it wasn't a Hallmark one, not that that's anything wrong with it, but uh, it, it reminded me um, one of my favorite Christmas experiences, one of my favorite Christmases. And when I think of one of my favorite Christmases, I think of the Christmas in December of 1981. I was four years old at that time. It's like such a magical time. Christmas was awesome. And I loved it. And, and one, I, got, I had been wanting this certain gift for a long time in my four-year-old mind. It would seem like forever for Christmas to get here. And finally, I got it. You want to see what, what my gift was? Here, here's a picture of December 1981. That's it. It's not quite black and white, but it's close. All right, I'm going to show you what I'm looking for. It's not the Spider-Man blanket or uh, the Spider-Man uh, sleeping bag, although that was pretty cool too. Um, but you do see a little uh, kind of like Red Rider back there, right? BB gun kind of thing. It wasn't a BB gun. My parents wouldn't let me have a BB gun when I was four. But, you know, it was a look like It's actually in the middle of the chair. It's a hat that's white, and it's got a black mask on it. And I wanted to be the Lone Ranger. More than anything. In fact, I love this gift so much that I wore it every day for almost four months. In fact, I have a picture of April 11, 1982. Do you know what April 11, 1982 was? Easter. Look at this picture. There I am. <laughs> I am ready for church. I'm locked and loaded. I'm ready to go. Before we needed security, I was there. Uh, <laughs> I got my tie on. I'm ready. To, man, look at those eyes. They're just, man, they're beaming right there. I loved that gift so much. I wore it every day I could. See, the gift that I received that I wanted so much became the source in the, in, of my joy and the cause for why I wanted to share it with anybody and everybody who would have an opportunity to see me and hear me. In our text this morning, Jesus calls another disciple, his name is Philip, to follow him. And this disciple is so excited about who Jesus is that he runs to his friend, his one, and brought him to Jesus. Here's our big idea this morning. Big idea. Jesus is both our source of eternal life and the cause for us sharing this message of love and hope with our one. Jesus is both the source of our eternal life and the cause for us wanting to share this message of love and hope with our one. Well, today, as we get to this third se uh, sermon in this series called Who's Your One, this marks the halfway point as we're walking through this series. And we've already understood, we've already set up, we've already said that we are not going to reach the world for Jesus. We're not going to win the world for Jesus by the thousands. The way that we win the world is one by one by one. 
is God has placed a one in front of me. God has placed a one in your life that is far from him. And they need to know who Jesus is. They need to hear of the salvation of Jesus. And God has placed that person in our life to give us that opportunity to be able to do that. So, where are you on that? <laughs> That's a hard question, right, to start off with. Well, let me, let me give you some, uh, uh, I don't know if this will help or hurt, really, but... I heard one uh, writer, uh, pastor, evangelist, he wrote, there's one thing that believers and non-believers have in common. They are both uptight about evangelism. <laughs> Do you feel uptight when it comes to sharing about Jesus with someone? Well, guess what? You already have that in common with the person you want to... They're uptight as well, and that's okay. It's okay to, to be nervous and to, to feel those ways. What about how are we doing? How, what are some statistics? Well... Uh, one of the statistics uh, that I saw says that 95% of people who say they have been saved will go to their death. They will never lead anyone to Christ. But I'm glad that that's not going to be any of us, right? That's why we're going through this. That's why we're looking at what God says about this. In fact, let's look at it even closer. That's the big statistic. What about in our church? What about in Highland? Uh, back in October... Clint and I went to the Lauderdale Baptist Association annual meeting, and as we were sitting there before the meeting started, I was flipping through the annual book of reports, and, and I, of course, I wanted to find Highland. I wanted to see how Highland's doing, and man, I saw, man, they're, they're generous. There's a lot of members, but like any other person and pastor, my eyes went to one specific spot. I want to know where's life change happening. We're glad that people are being generous so that the mission goes forward. We're glad that people are joining the church. But where are, is life change happening? And there's one column in that book of reports that tells us about life change. It is baptisms. And as I looked there, I went down and for last year, and this is absolutely not a knock against any other previous leadership or any leadership that was uh, not here before I was, or that was here before I was, but here's what it said. Baptisms, five. Amen for those five. But I leaned over to Clint and I said, this will never happen again. Five people out of 52 Sundays, five people out of an average of 225 to 40 people in here and out of here for 52 Sundays. Man, we, we got some work to do, guys. Amen. That's why this, this who's your one is so important. Because that's, that's where we are, but that's not where God wants us to be. That's not what God has saved us to do. Man, God has so much bigger plans for Highland Baptist Church and for you and for me in this. We have a choice as Highland Baptist Church to either evangelize or to fossilize. What does that mean? We either are going to reach new people for Christ or we're going to continue on doing what we've always done. And that number... Next year's book of reports is not going to really be any different. We don't want that, do we? No. No, we want Jesus to change other people's lives. I believe that you want that. I want that. And that's what we're going to learn today. There are three actions, absolutely three actions, that must take place immediately if we're going to continue to see more and more and more people come to faith in Christ, that God is going to change other people's lives, and he's going to continue to grow this church and the church, his church around the world. Because Jesus is both our source of eternal life and the cause for us sharing this message of hope and love. So you ready to know what those three action steps are? I'm going to make this as simple and straightforward as I can today. Number one, action step one, no excuses. No excuses excuses people man we can use all kinds of excuses can't we we're good at it and we can use all kinds of excuses why i i don't need to or can't share the gospel i mean maybe we've used some of these before i'm not qualified i'm not a pastor i'm not a, a minister i don't work in the church i can't do that or i'm not I, i'm too young or, or i'm too old sometimes people may say i'm not gifted or i'm not talented and i don't know all the answers uh, I, i'm shy or I'm, I'm too introverted like that i'm not perfect i don't have my life together how in the world am i supposed to tell somebody else how to get theirs together and even this one will come up sometimes when it's a person that has hurt us in the past, I don't really want that person to be saved. We use all kinds of excuses for why people don't need to know Jesus and why I don't need to share them. But what did Philip do? He didn't make any excuses. 
Look at the text with me in verse 43. Pick up right there. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we, fa we have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip said to him, come and see. So in the text, we don't see Philip making any excuses about why he should go after his, or should not go after his one. In fact, what we do see is that Jesus found Philip, and, and he said to him, I want you to follow me, and Philip did. But in his excitement of following Jesus, he went to the one person that needed to know next, Nathaniel. And, and if you're wondering who that is, well, it, the other gospel writers, a lot of times we, they use the word Bartholomew, and, the, and pretty much the same, what most people think is the same guy. So he went to Nathaniel. Now, why was Philip so excited? We're going to deal with this at the end more in detail, but why was he so excited to go and find his one? Why didn't excuses ever come up in Philip's mind? Well, because the first thing that he did was, or that he believed that Jesus is the Messiah. He is God's promised Savior, the only way to have salvation, the only way to have forgiveness, the only way to, to, to be saved, the only way to have a right relationship with God was through Jesus. And when he understood that, that motivated him, that propelled him to go to his one, who was Nathaniel. Philip's belief that Jesus is the promised Messiah, it motivated him. It sent him to find Nathaniel. Now look what happened in the exchange. So he goes and finds Nathaniel. He tells Nathaniel, hey look, I, we found the one that Moses and the prophets all talked about. That means he found the Messiah. What was Nathaniel's response? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Have you ever had a, 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 an opportunity to share the gospel and you're like pumped and you're stoked and, and you just can't wait to share the gospel and then you do and then all of a sudden they let somebody, the person just pours cold water on that fire that, that was ignited. Well, sure, I think we've all had that at some point. But look what Philip does, no excuses. He doesn't use any excuse. He doesn't sit there and say, well, Nathaniel, I think you're wrong because Nazareth is prophesied from you know, the Old Testament. Or Nathaniel, I think you're wrong that you shouldn't be so derogatory about someone who's also living around us. He didn't do any of that. He just used this opportunity, this objection, to just invite Nathaniel to come check Jesus out for yourself. Look, you don't have to take my word for it. Just come check Jesus out for yourself. What an opportunity that Philip used here. Have you ever seen the show Hoarders? It's like walking into dirt cheap for me. Man, I can't do that store. I know some of you do, but I can't do that store. I don't really like the, the movie, uh, the show Hoarders, but in that show, people are just collecting stuff, and they collect it, and they collect it, until you, I mean, before too long, I mean, it's just piles and piles and piles of magazines, of whatever trinket, or whatever it may be, that they, they love so much, and the, the thing that always amazes me about this show is that they will come up with any and every excuse of why they should not clean out all the clutter. How many sermons have you heard in your lifetime? How many hymns or Christian songs in here and on, if you listen to K-Love or some other uh, radio station, have you sung? How many Christian books have you read? How many Christian movies have you watched? How many times have you heard or read the Christmas story? All of these things, all of that truth is being poured into us by God, and yet many people are still, still spiritually hoarding all of the truth that God has dumped into us week after week after week. And then we use every excuse known to man why I can't share and be a dispenser of this same truth that has been poured into me week after week. Guess what? Moses, he had a speech impediment. Noah got drunk. Abraham was old. Jacob was a liar and a swindler. David had an affair and was a murderer. Peter even denied knowing Jesus. And if God can use people like that, guess what? God can use us too. God is not waiting for you to be perfect. He's not waiting for you to have the greatest ability in the world. He's waiting for us to come to him and be available to him. 2 Corinthians 4, 7, Paul says, But we have this treasure in jars of clay. That treasure that he's talking about is the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
We have this treasure in jars of clay to show, that's a, that's a, that's a why, uh, answering a why question. Why do we have this treasure in jars of clay? To show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. So if you don't think you can share the gospel, guess what? The Bible says you can't either. That's why you need Jesus. You can't do it on your own. I can't do it on my own. Stop making the excuses. It's the power of God through the gospel that propels us and gives us the words to say. It is the power of God at work through His Spirit in our life that uses broken vessels like us to share with other beggars that, hey, I'm not, I don't have it all together, but I know somebody who does, and man, does he love you. And his name is Jesus. That's why we don't use excuses, but we rely on God's power at work in us. So, number one action that we need to take. Stop the excuses. No more excuses. Action step number two. Be intentional. Be intentional. I love this little phrase right here. It says, Philip, after Jesus told him to follow him, what is it? Philip found Nathaniel. Last time I thought about the word found, I don't think that's by accident, is it? That's somebody that's searching. That's somebody that's looking for something. He's very intentional about what he's looking for. So Jesus, uh, he calls Philip to follow him. And so Philip's next thought was, okay, who's the next person that I got to tell this news to, that we have found Jesus? He went to search for his one. So my question that I'm thinking through this as I was uh, writing the sermon was, why should we be intentional? Why is it that we should be intentional? Why does God want us to be intentional? Now, yes, it is to bring others to Christ, and we'll get there a little later, but I think there's an even more important reason why we should be intentional. It's because God is an intentional God. God is an intentional God. Everything that God does is for an intentional purpose. It is not like God, when he was creating everything, sneezed and out came a giraffe. That's funny, but that's not what happened. He intentionally created this giraffe, and he intentionally created each one of you. Psalm 139, 14, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. God is a God of intentionality. And not only that in creation, but God intentionally at the right time, at the right spot uh, in, on the earth, and at the right political climate, everything was right in history when God sent Jesus. Did you know that? That Jesus just didn't wake up uh, one day in heaven and say, hey, I think I'm going to go check out this whole thing called earth that uh, you know, people are running amok down there and maybe I can do something about it. No, God sent Jesus at just the right time. Galatians 4, 4 and 5, Paul says, But when the fullness of time had come, that means at just the right time in God's history, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law so that we might receive adoptions as sons. Everything that God does is for a specific purpose. He sent Jesus at just the right time in history for you and for me. Isn't that what we celebrate at Christmas? It's God's inbreaking into human history at just the right time. Now, everybody's got a favorite pastime, I believe. For some, it may be baseball. Um, some, it may be playing card games or board games. And, and, and I like a lot of those things, but... If I had to say my favorite pastime, you're going to think I'm creepy, and you can't say this now because it's like all stalkery-like and everything, but I like people watching. I really do. And when I used to go to the mall, you know, it, I don't really go much anymore. I can't, I don't know if it's because it's too dangerous or we have no money because of the five kids, but, you know, whatever, but I don't really go anymore. But when we used to go, uh, Rochelle, I'd, I'd walk around and um, she would go into the stores and, and I'd always sit on the, the bench outside the store, like, like most of you guys, right? And we sit up there and I just loved watching people. I liked watching how fast they walk, how slow they walk. What are they? What, what do you? What do I think they're talking about? I mean, what are they wearing? Who are they with? What are they doing? You can learn a lot about people uh, when you just observe. Well, guess what, guys? Non-believers, they're watching us. Absolutely watching us. One of the most often used excuses a non-believer will use for why I don't 
go to a church or why I don't come to Christ is the church is full of what? Hypocrites, Hypocrites right? Now, other than that's literally one of the worst excuses I have ever heard of and can think of, that's the, that's the litmus test that they use for the validity or the truth that's coming out of our mouth. They want to know, is what you talk about the same way that you walk? Are you walking the talk? Your coworkers, guys, ladies, are observing you. Your classmates, students, observe you. They watch you. Your non-believing family uh, and, and neighbors and, and family members, they are watching us, listening to us, to see if we walk the talk. And here's what we do. We defy their expectations. We, we, we look for opportunities to sabotage that false belief by the way that you live, by the way that you love, by the way that Jesus comes across your mouth and your lips and your tongue. You look for those opportunities to display grace to those who need it. We look for those opportunities to share the gospel with them. No one accidentally comes to faith in Jesus. God was intentional in sending His Son at just the right time, and someone was intentional in sharing the gospel with each one of you that have come to know Him. Be intentional with your one. So, we don't make any excuses. We're intentional. And the, the, the final one that, that I see here is that it's a two-parter, but it's the same thing. It goes together. Go and tell. Go and tell. So what, what did Philip do? Well, it's pretty simple. He followed Jesus, and he went and told Nathaniel about Jesus. He, he invited his friend to come and to see Jesus for himself. And that's the same thing that Jesus wants for every single one of us in here that know him and follow him today. So uh, a couple questions. You know, why did Philip go and tell? Well, he believed that Jesus here, when he understood who Jesus was, he was more important than, than anything or anyone else at that moment in his life. He was more important. Uh, Jesus was more important. He was important enough to go tell his friend about Jesus. Philip believed that Jesus was the Messiah, the promised one of God that would save Israel. That's verse 45 there. And the question here is, do we believe the same thing about Jesus? Jesus is the source of our eternal life, but also the cause, the, the motivation for us sharing this same message of hope and love with others. Is Jesus that important in our life? And as I saw this on another writer's post earlier this week, if you want to change your behavior, change who you worship. Oftentimes, the world crowds Jesus out of our, our, our purview and, and, and out of our focus. And we begin to, to worship ourselves and how these things can help us fulfill our specific desires that we have in our life. And if we want to change, well, change who you focus on. Put Jesus in the front there. Begin to worship Him. Begin to focus on Him. So how do we go and tell? How do we do this, what Philip did? Well, as we said already, you don't have to know everything about the Bible. But there are a few things that you do need to know about the gospel that's, uh, that the Bible talks about uh, repeatedly. So what are those things? Well, it's in four parts. And if you've sat in my office and you've heard me share the gospel, you've heard these four parts that come out in some conversation. God, man, Jesus, and response. It's a really easy way to remember this. God, man, Jesus, response. So what does that look like? Well, here's what you need to know. He, that is God, is the creator of all things. And he is holy and he is righteous. People sin and sin separates us from God and places us under the wrath of God. Because God loves us, he sent his son Jesus to pay for our sins. And although Jesus had no sin, he died on the cross for you and for me. And then he was raised on the third day. But for us to be forgiven and of our sins and have eternal life, then we have to do three things. We confess our sins. That means we agree uh, with God that we have sin and we can't do anything to pay for those sins. So we agree with God that we, we have sin. Number two, that we repent. That means we turn from sin. And number three is we turn to God through believing in Jesus. That is confess our sins, repent of our sins, or turn, and we trust God in Christ. That's the gospel. That's what you need to know. That's e you could sit down for 10 minutes this afternoon and learn that. God, man, Jesus response. 
And if you don't have, you know, if you, if you forget that, look, come to me anytime. I'd love to be able to share. That's, that's probably the one that I use the most because I, I can use that in everyday conversation at any point because it takes about two minutes just to share. Look, this is what God has done for you. God, man, Jesus response. That's how we go and how we tell. Now, I want to tell you a story that I found um, in this book. Uh, it's called Tell Someone by uh, Pastor Greg Laurie. This book is, uh, this is not the one from our library, but it is available in our, in our library, and it's good. Um, we have such good uh, librarians and such uh, thoughtful librarians, and they pick good books for that will help you and, and, um, and help you grow in your, your walk with Christ. And in this book, Greg Laurie is the pastor of Harvest Christian Fellowship, a large church in California. And he tells a story entitled, Go Into All the World, Even the Restroom. I want, you, I want to read this for you, okay, because I love this story. Some years ago, I was in a department store in a mall, and I had to use the bathroom. Once seated, I heard a man clear his throat in the stall next to me. We were the only ones in the restroom. After a few minutes, that same man said to me, Hi. Please understand, I do not normally talk to people in public restrooms. My objective is to get in and out as quickly as possible. So I shot back, uh, hi, as curtly as I could. Another moment passed and the guy says, do you have something for me? I could not believe this conversation. Who was this person? What was he up to? I firmly said, no, I do not. Oh, he responded, clearly disappointed. Then my curiosity was piqued. I asked, why? What are you looking for exactly? Well, I was going to buy some drugs, he sheepishly responded. Then it occurred to me, could this possibly be a divine appointment? Would God want me to actually share the gospel through a stall wall in a public restroom? I was game. So I said, I don't have drugs, but I have something far better for you. <laughs> it's kind of like a Peter moment, right? He seemed excited. What? What is it? A personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. I said, and then I thought, what am I doing? You can't share the gospel in a bathroom stall. And so there was a moment of silence, and he said, oh, I've already tried that. Oh, I was surprised. Really? Did you ever go to a church? He then said, yes, I went to Harvest Christian Fellowship. <laughs> oh, this wasn't indeed a divine appointment. <laughs> Do you know who I am, I said? I'm Greg Laurie, the pastor of Harvest Christian Fellowship. And there was a moment of silence, and he then said, oh, my God. I had to laugh. I said, buddy, God must really love you. Here you are trying to make a drug buy, and the Lord sends your pastor to deter you. I went on to tell him he needed to make a recommitment to follow Christ. I was tired of bathroom ministry, so I told him to meet me outside in the sock department, which was nearby. He was easy to spot. He was a guilty-looking guy walking out. We then prayed together, and he made a recommitment to follow Jesus Christ. No question, this was an appointment with God for this young man and myself. And in a men's restroom of all places, understand, I'm not necessarily encouraging you to strike up conversations in such a place, but what I am saying is always be ready. You never know when the Lord will call on you. Absolutely amen. Go and tell. And that means everywhere. No excuses be intentional, and go and tell. That's right. I want to draw our time to a close this morning with highlighting what I think the most important verse in our passage is. And the, the, ver, the reason why this verse is the most important one is that in this verse it, it shows us that we can have eternal life with God and the motivation to share it with others. So Philip, in verse 43, says to Nathaniel, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Now, I understand we don't have to get into this theological uh, uh, conversation, but yes, God does find us. But here, Philip says we have found Jesus here. He believed that Jesus was the promised Messiah that the Old Testament points to. In fact, many biblical scholars say that there are over 500 uh, messianic prophecies in the Old Testament alone, and Jesus, Jesus fulfilled every one of them. Isaiah 7.14 is quoted in Matthew 1.23, and where uh, I believe the angel says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. 
All of the Old Testament points us to Jesus as God's promised Messiah, the Savior of the world. This is why Jesus was so adamant and he was so forward with the religious leaders in the same book of John, just four chapters later, in John chapter 5, verse 39, Jesus says to these religious leaders, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me, yet you refuse to come to me that you may have eternal life. Jesus is the source of our eternal life and the calls for us to share it with everyone else around us, including our one. So as Abby and the instrumentalists come forward, what I want you to do is I want you to bow your heads. You guys, go ahead and come on forward. Everybody else, just bow your head and close your eyes, please. i got a couple of questions I want to ask you before we're done. The first is, do you have eternal life in Jesus Christ? That is the most important question you will ever be asked in this life. Do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? If you die today, where would you spend eternity? And if you, without a doubt, you could say, I would be with the Lord forever and ever and ever, then praise God for that. But if you can't, or if you don't know, then guess what? The Bible says today is the day of salvation. You can take care of that before you walk out of these doors. And if you want that kind of life that Jesus promises you, then right now, right where you are, I want to help you to pray something like this. You can repeat after me if you need to. Father, I know that I have sin, and my sin has separated me from you. I know that Jesus is the only way I can be saved. And I want him to be my savior today. Jesus, will you come and live in me today? Will you help me to follow you with everything I am until I see you face to face one day? Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now, let's keep our heads bowed and eyes closed. If you were one of those individuals that you're just not sure, and, and you prayed that prayer today, I just want you to look up uh, to me. Just look this way. If you prayed that prayer, the Bible says that you are a new creation. The old things have passed away Behold, all things become new. Another way the Bible talks about it is that you're like a newborn infant. And just like a physical baby uh, can't grow and feed themselves on their own and take care of themselves on their own, somebody needs to do that. Well, guess what? That's what uh, we can do today. Is that if you are a new ba baby in Christ, and uh, uh, you have been born again, as we talk about then I want to help you grow in your new relationship with Jesus. And so in just a few moments, when we start singing, I'm going to ask you, if you prayed that prayer, just to come down front and let me know your decision that you made for Jesus today. And I want to help you begin to start that new relationship that you have with your Lord, Jesus Christ. Now, everybody else, uh, uh, look back up here. Now, I'm going to assume that all the rest of you who just looked up know Jesus, um, that you know where your eternity with him lies. So I'm going to ask for three specific commitments from you in just a few moments. Commitment one, stop the excuses. Just go into it thinking, no more excuses. I mean, think about it. What's the worst that can, uh, that can happen if you share the gospel? The worst that could happen is, say, the person pulls a gun and shoots you. Okay, well, you get to be with Jesus forever. I mean, it's a pretty far outlandish thing that's going to happen. But so you get to be with Jesus forever. That's the worst that could happen. What's the worst that could happen if you do not? Well, that person could feasibly, realistically spend an eternity apart from Jesus forever and ever and ever. Surely the soul of that one that God has placed in your life is worth stopping the excuse. 
Be intentional. That's commitment too. Be intentional. It, it's one thing to take the opportunities and be intentional, but I'd say go the next step and make the opportunity. Be that intentional. Make the, set the lunch date. Set the coffee uh, time. Ask them the coffee. Look for opportunities that you can leverage and take advantage of to be able to share the gospel, the, the hope and love of Christ. And then the, the third, so we're looking at no excuse, be intentional, and then make the commitment to do something about it starting today. Go and tell. Okay? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the day. We love you. We ask that you would continue to use uh, this church for your glory and for the good of Christ in this city. And Lord, for those that you have saved, God, we pray that you would give them the courage to step out and to, to, take, that, uh, to, to take that help to, to learn how to start a new relationship with you, God. We pray that you would accomplish what you want to accomplish for your great glory and our good. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.